Hi everybody, I'm Joanne Haig. We welcome our viewers in Barbados and around the world to Face It and Fix It on CBC TV 8, YouTube and Facebook. Now, what's on my mind this morning, it's going to go along with our guests uh, that we have on our show and it pertains to NCDs, um, the long name non-communicable disease, diseases, and um, I wanted to share some of my personal, my personal experience with this. Um, I don't know if I have an NCD. I really don't. I, I, I don't go to the doctor um, because for me, I'm figuring if it's not broken, then don't go look for something. Uh, but that's me. But recently, um, a close family member of mine um, is on dialysis, um, is a diabetic, has hypertension, has glaucoma, um, and taking heart medication too as well. Now, and, and she's 80, um, but she didn't know, not now get all of these uh, problems. Um, these problems were ongoing from the time she was in her 40s in particular um, diabetes. Now, this woman that I'm speaking of is the strongest woman I know. I actually think that I, I call her a cat because I believe she has like nine lives. Every time she took ill, she bounced back. Um, QEA, she would go to, she'd always bounce back. Um, over the years, um, the kidney aspect of things kicked in. Um, I understand sometimes the long usage of, of insulin can impact the kidneys. And of course, our family, we were a little distraught when we heard that the kidneys were at 6%. And for a woman that goes to a doctor every month, I asked myself, at what point did you not know that there were 70 or 60 or 50 or 40? How do you not know that your kidneys are down to 6%? So she is on peritoneal dialysis and um, she has to do that every night. So what's on my mind is it's hard to watch um, when your loved ones have to go through these uh, situations, especially when you've got a, a whole set of them. Sometimes if it's just diabetes and you deal with that, but if it's a combination of diabetes, renal failure, heart problems, um, if you just hold your head and you beg God for some guidance and you beg God to make sure that they don't not in pain and that person is my mother so it's hard to watch but you try your best as your as children to do what you can because your parents they were there for you when you were young and if you can do whatever you can now um, to avoid these diseases I urge you to do so I don't want to be disingenuous and say that I do everything that is right I sit here on this show called Face It and Fix It because there are a number of issues that I have to face. And healthcare is one of those issues that I, I run from because the older I get, the more I realize that something is around the corner or could be here. And when you are a parent or you are in a position where people depend on you, you don't want to go to the doctor because they're depending on you because they have health problems. So you ask yourself, do I want to go, do you want to go to a doctor to find out something is wrong? Then you have to take yourself out of the equation and then you have to be worried about yourself and then you find out, you kind of go, what's going to happen to the people that depend on you? And that's something that I'm struggling with. That's something that I have to face. That's something that I have to, um, to live with or, or to change uh, because when other people are making plans for a pension, I make something called an exit plan, which means I want to put everything in place with the people that depend on me so that the day that I go, um, then they'll be all right. So it is so fitting that we would have today the discussion on NCDs and sugar by the numbers, diabetics, and to help us understand the nature of this disease and other NCDs is Dr. Natasha Sobers Granham, Senior Lecturer in Public Health and Epidemiology at the University of the West Indies Cavefield Campus and Lead Researcher um, of the Barbados National Registry for Non 
communicable diseases. And for short, NCDs, we will refer to them as NCDs uh, throughout the show. We will also meet today a dynamic woman, a woman that just gives, gives a lot of, uh, I should say, a lot of help to so many people. I was lost for words there because I only spoke to her last night and she blew me away with her personality. We have with us Sharon Bellamy Thompson. She uh, recently uh, had an, got an award, MCTV COVID Hero winner. And uh, we are going to speak with her about her life and service and what prompted her to just get out there and just feed so many people. So as usual, we want to hear from you. Call us 228-5562, 228-5563 or send us a WhatsApp message to 228-5562. If you are following us on Facebook, send your messages there, type in CBC Barbados, and we will share your comments. Remember, give us a call, take the opportunity, and if you don't, listen in, call a friend, because this show is going to pertain, I believe, to every family in Barbados. I, I don't believe that there's a family who has not been touched by another person who is suffering from one of these diseases that we will be discussing in the show. When we come back, Dr. Sobers Granum after the break. Welcome back to Face It and Fix It. As I said, our first guest is Dr. Natasha Sobers Granham, Senior Lecturer in Public Health and Epidemiology at the UWI, also Lead Researcher of Barbados National Registry for NCDs. Welcome to the show, Dr. Sobers Granham. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Thank you very much for having me. Are you hearing me clearly? Loud and clear. Loud okay, and clear. Fantastic. Great. So, um, so, okay, I just wanted to say again, you know, we don't want to thank you for taking the time to spend a, a few minutes with us on the show on what is a pressing issue in Barbados, probably around the world, but because we are so small, we have so many people uh, suffering from these um, comorbidities. And I wanted to ask you exactly what are NCDs so that those listening can have a better idea as we go forward with our questions. So um, first, before I answer your question directly, I just want to say how much touched I was by uh, what you shared um, initially and uh, about your mom and so on, because so many persons are, are dealing with something exactly the same. Um, as you said, it, it's touching every family. Um, there's a very, very high prevalence in Barbados. So I just wanted to say how you know touched I was by your um, by your sharing. Um, so non-communicable diseases, we are talking about anything that is not uh, transmitted. But really, when we are talking um, about the 
the NCDs in, in this sort of form, we're talking about the big, the big five, we call them. So cardiovascular diseases. So we're usually talking about heart attacks, strokes. We're talking about diabetes. Um, we're talking about cancer um, generally. And we're also talking about uh, mental health diseases. That's what we're talking overall about NCDs. And that's th those by themselves uh, are, are quite a bit uh, to talk about. So um, mm -hmm. cardiovascular diseases, they absolutely mo they're, they're the most common um, in terms of NCDs and NCD mortality in Barbados. Cancer, number two, um, absolutely. When you add diabetes to that uh, equation, also very, very large. So those are the, the most common ones, and those are the ones that we talk about. But NCDs can also include other things like autoimmune diseases and so on. Um, renal failure as well, kidney disease? Yes, yeah. so renal failure, kidney disease, um, uh, a card of, uh, but normally we, we, we think about that as sort of the, the end stage, heart failure, all those things, all, can, all included in non-communicable diseases. Um, so when we say, sometimes when we say diabetes, we're thinking about the, the complications of diabetes. And that's one of the most common complications of diabetes. So uh, diabetes with renal failure, diabetes with its diabetic retinopathy affecting the eyes, diabetes um, and, and uh, how it affects then uh, the heart as well. Uh, so diabetes and how it affects the nerves, all of those things are encompassed in the term non-communicable diseases. So we know that you do a lot of research, obviously as part of your job. What has your research showed you in terms of why is this happening and, the, and is there an increase, especially now we have COVID, you know? Um, okay, so is there an increase? Not necessarily within COVID, so let's talk about, you know, generally. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of cardiovascular disease, if we tend to look at um, the trends uh, in terms of mortality, so in terms of persons dying from these conditions. And uh, we did have decreases between, let's say, 1990 to 2010. But more recently, we have been seeing trends, more recently from about 2015, 2016, we've been seeing trends towards a slight increases in cardiovascular disease again. And that's not good because we would expect that um, with improvements in health care and improvements in hypertension and so on, that we would expect um, those decreases that we were seeing before to continue. So the fact that they, that now our cardiovascular disease rate, so that's heart attacks, stroke, and diabetes are increasing, that, that's a concern for us. So we have increasing rates of heart, heart attacks, increasing rates of um, strokes, we have increasing rates also of diabetes. That's also been gradually increasing. That's never been decreasing at all. And increasing rates of obesity. Uh, that is um, looking at the trends of, you know, uh, over the past, let's say 10, 15 years. That is very, very concerning. And it is concerning because yes, we're thinking about this, but we're also thinking about persons living a quality life um, uh, and uh, uh, having had these conditions. And actually when I, when I think about uh, NCDs, I, I, uh, I tend to do lots of workshops with, with persons. Um, and we have a workshop where we try to, um, to uh, impact on persons the importance of living a healthy life with a chronic condition. That it, it, you can still live a healthy life with a chronic condition. So hypertension, you go, you get screened, you know you have hypertension, it is still possible to live a healthy life with a chronic condition, to manage it properly, to eat properly and so on. Um, so we, I really wanna encourage people this morning to get tested, still know your status, and so that we don't progress to the stage where we're having heart failure. So we don't progress to the stage where we're having the heart attacks, progress to the stage where we're having uh, renal failure. So we, we, we know we have a chronic condition and we are managing it and living a healthy life with that chronic condition, or of course, even uh, preventing that chronic condition from occurring. So th that's really mm -hmm. something I want to stress this morning. Living, a, you can still live a healthy life, even if you are, if you, even if you have hypertension, diabetes, you are diagnosed with these things. Um, it is still possible to control them and live a healthy life with these conditions. So for people sitting at home watching uh, you, 
and hearing, okay, we're talking about managing it, but I want to know how did, how did we get there? Uh, is it hereditary? Is it lifestyle choices? Give us a, a rough idea. How do we get to this situation? We have so many people. Yes, yeah, so I mean, it, it, it's definitely a combination. So uh, the, um, the, the studies have found that there are persons with a genetic predisposition to hypertension and diabetes. Um, and, uh, but that is coupled with our environment. And the fact that we currently live in what we term a obesogenic environment, and that there are significant commercial determinants of health and social determinants that are contributing to where we are now. So yes, we have that hereditary underlying um, risk, but even that we can control, even that through the way that we live our lives, we can control. But because we have this obesogenic environment, we are, we are surrounded by um, you know, all the foods that put us at risk. We are also um, surrounded by uh, we also we've also ha uh, trained our lives in such a way that we don't have enough physical activity we're not doing the things that uh, promote health in our life uh, even things like sleep sleep has been shown to be connected to obesity we're not getting enough sleep uh, so these things are are contributing uh, to us having these chronic diseases uh, so that's just to summarize it's the foods that we are eating um, and eating too many of these foods, it's the lack of physical activity, it's things like sleep, uh, and all those things are layered on our genetic predisposition or our risk factors or our family history as well. Our Deputy Prime Minister, the Honorable Santia Bradshaw in 2018, made a public announcement that she was about to tackle the, the, the biggest challenge of her life. And she told Barbadians about her breast cancer. She was very transparent about it. Mm -hmm. And let me just say how happy I am that she's okay. But again, I can tell you because I, I, know, I know the Deputy Prime Minister long before she even entered into politics. And I can tell you she always ate healthy. I don't even think she eats meat. Um, I was exercising. So in my mind, when she announced that, I'm thinking, how in heaven's name does a person yes. who looks so healthy, who's doing all of the right things, doesn't have a history, you know, to that extent, mm -hmm. ends up like this. And I'm thinking mm -hmm. uh, maybe it was stress because she was going through a lot of elections and it could be. Because stress, you said stress is a factor for obesity, but can that be a problem in this environment we're living? A lot of people are stressed. I mean, it, it is difficult to, um, or, or we shouldn't really extrapolate the population effects to mm -hmm. individual effects. Mm -hmm. So why our population is going through this is is really the poor eating, the physical inactivity, and so on and so forth. But how that then translates to an individual, um, an individual might have some risk factor, some underlying thing that we are not certain about because that is not, um, not investigated their particular case. Uh, when we say things like, uh, you know, your foods put you at increased risk, that's on a population level. Eating this particular food will put you, will put the population at risk. Uh, so people like to point out, oh, you know, I know this 95-year-old that you know drink, you know, whatever drinks till they were whatever, and they and they didn't die. But on average, if people drink lots of sweet drinks, and on average, if people are overweight, on average, they're they are at increased risk. That does not always translate into the individual. Um, and, and it's a difficult concept to deal with and it's a difficult uh, thing to understand, especially when, as you say, you are living a healthy life and then these things come along. And um, uh, certainly, you know, just uh, stepping away from the numbers a bit, but I've also uh, dealt with that as well. You know, I try to eat healthy and exercise and so on, um, but I also had uh, health challenges, something that I was born with no control over. So you can't have control over everything. Uh, but what you do have control over, you you exercise that control as far as possible. All right, we're going to take a break. But when we come back, we want to discuss the recent tax on sugar and what has your research or have you done any research 
on sugar and the effects of sugar because I think a lot of people just thinking that brown sugar that you see in the supermarket when I understand that there are a lot of other things that can create sugar in your body that is also bad for you. So when we come back, we want to talk about the sugar tax and does it make even sense to have a tax and will it deter Barbadians? We'll be back after the break. Welcome back to Face It and Fix It. We are speaking with Dr. Natasha Sobers Granham. Before the break, we mentioned about those sugary drinks and the taxes. So there's been a lot of discussion about that. What are your thoughts about the tax hike to, to start with? Yeah, so <laughs> there are a couple of things that I, I really want to be absolutely clear on because there, as you said, there has been a lot of discussion. Um, and so these few things I want to be clear on are sugar sweetened beverages uh, increases our risk of obesity. Mm -hmm. Sugar sweetened beverages, they also increase the risk for type 2 diabetes. Uh, sugar sweetened beverages um, increase your risk for overall uh, mortality or in, um, dying early, called premature mortality, so then before 70. Um, and they also increase your risk for some cancers, but the link between the sugar sweetened beverages and obesity and the sugar sweetened beverages and cardiovascular disease, that's very, very strong. Between cancer, it's a little bit weaker. So sugar sweetened beverages absolutely increase your risk for obesity, type 2 diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. Um, we, we focus on, on producing on the tax because uh, a tax of at least 20% uh, in many countries has been shown to decrease consumption in the countries where it's imposed. We had started at 10%. But WHO showed that because of the um, inelasticity of, um, of sugar sweetened beverages, it needed to be at least 20%. So now we've gone to that stage. So I am on the side of the evidence, which says that a, a, a tax of at least 20% does reduce consumption in the countries where, um, where it's occurring. So it, it reduces consumption. Apart from WHO and the other studies, we actually did a study here, Dr. Miriam Alvarado, uh, Professor Alafia Samuels, Dr. Maddie Murphy, where they looked at the if the impact of the ten percent tax that was that was uh, placed in twenty fifteen, and they found that fifteen to eighteen months later they had seen a four percent reduction, four and a half percent reduction in the sugar sweetened beverage consumption. Uh, it also pushed uh, persons towards healthier consumption, so they also saw an increase in the water consumption. So the tax does several things: it decreases consumption but it also pushes towards healthier drink um, uh, um, uh, usage. Um, and it's also what, what they called a health signal. So it signals to the public that, there, that these uh, particular things that are being taxed are not healthy. So absolutely, I'm in support of the tax and the evidence is in support of the tax as well. There was a WhatsApp that just came up and I want it back on the screen because I, it's, they're so on point they, they indicated why raise the tax if the producer can put it up. But for what I can remember, instead of raising the prices on sweet drinks and other unhealthy foods, we should lower the prices on the healthy ones. That would make yeah, so, more sense. I agree yeah, with that. So what, we, we absolutely, mm -hmm. Yeah, we absolutely agree with the subsidy for healthier foods. Uh, so we, we, um, we are in support of a suite of, um, of measures. And that's one of these one of the measures. We support 
a, a subsidy on the healthier food so that we can increase our food and vegetable consumption. But the reality is, is that we also want to reduce sugar, sweet and beverage consumption. That is the reality. Um, because our sugar, sweet and beverage consumption is far too high. It's far too high when we compare to um, other places in the world, but it's just far too high um, generally. Dr. Rachel Harris, she's a nutritionist. Um, she, she also completed a study that looked at the proportion of our foods from ultra processed foods. So not just uh, um, sugar sweetened, but ultra processed foods. And we, uh, 40 percent of our um, uh, foods come from ultra processed foods. And a lot of that, the highest um, proportion within the ultra processed foods was actually from sugar sweetened beverages. And because they have such low nutrient content, so there are calories without nutrients. They are an important target to have people reduce their consumption. So we, of course, we want people to eat fruits and vegetables, but we also want to decrease the amount of unhealthy foods that we are using. So we support the subsidy. I absolutely support the WhatsApp message that says we should uh, lower the foods on um, lower the price, price mm -hmm. on healthy mm -hmm. foods. Mm -hmm. Lower the price, absolutely, one hundred percent supported. But I also support. Uh, increasing the prices on the unhealthy foods because the consumption of those foods is far too high in our population and we cannot continue to support um the the uh the economic cost the productivity losses we can't continue to support the social burden that it's causing in our society the quality of life burden that it's causing in our society we have to do something and that that's just one measure but i support the other as well yeah, because I, I know there are some people and poor people will tell you I go home and cook some ramen because that's what they can. And ramen has no nutritional value. It, it fills a hole. I mean, you're hungry. You can eat some ramen. People, you know, corned beef, something that, you know, it's so salty and things. I just find that it's almost like we got this thing wrong because all of the healthy, most of the healthy foods. I, I see what the government was making an attempt to do on things like Lucerma and, and Sure. I can tell you that I can't even put that in front of my mother because she tells me that milk makes her feel upset. It may be her mind, but that's, she doesn't want that. But we can't expect people to eat healthy and have a healthy lifestyle and try to avoid the Queen Elizabeth Hospital if um, Things are expensive. I can't afford, well, I have to buy yams. My daughter, uh, Sky, is allergic to rice, believe it or not, and, and, and lettuce. She has, she has 40 food allergies. And I found lentil rice in a place on the South Coast, $15 a box. And when I tell you the box was like this big and this big, could probably give you a meal for three people once a day. Um, so you've got to go down that road. So I'm hoping that government would get it done better because to buy two yams i think it was what 13 dollars a pound i mean okay yams are big and i'm thinking well we can't afford to eat yams anymore you know and, and the things that have no nutritional value none i mean look at bread the bread in every barbadian home yes they want bread but when we look at flour it's not really that good for you um I don't, I'm not a nutritionist, I think, but people say that it turns into sugar. So we talk about direct sugar and indirect sugar, but again, I'm not a doctor and I don't want to put you in the spot, but your research speaks only to sugar, sugar, actual sugar, or things that right. translate into. Right, so, okay, so, so it was um, Dr. Harris, and the thing about, uh, she did find that we eat a, a lot of sugar, as you say, uh, but we tend to be a little bit more cautious about what we call free sugars or mm -hmm. added sugars. Um, mm -hmm. And the free sugars, you know, of course, those are existing in um, in the sugar sweetened beverages and so on. But we also like to see lower um, salt in the bread because people uh, consume the bread um, and um, better usage of the of uh, carbohydrates because when sugar and sugar in sweet potato is not the same thing as uh, sugar in um, sugar sweetened beverage, even if it's the same calorie intake. Mm -hmm. Even when you have the same calorie intake, sugar in, um, in sweet potato, because it's coming with fiber, because it's coming with nutritional value, is actually better for you. 
And part of the reason for that is because sugar sweetened beverages, one, they're empty calories and have very little nutritional value, but also they, um, they, they don't cause you to feel sated. They do not cause you to feel satisfied. And actually, so you, so, so they promote obesity in that they push you to go and drink something else in another hour because you've just drank, you want to drink in another hour and a drink in another hour. So it, it's actually not calorie for calorie. Um, sugar in, so like I said, sugar in the carbs and sugar in the bread is not the same thing as uh, sugar in SSBs. Um, okay. Although we want to reduce sugar overall, mm -hmm. right? We want to reduce sugar overall, absolutely. But free and added sugar, um, those are particularly bad. So if you get a sugar from apples, because it's coming with fiber, the way that the body handles that sugar is actually different. The, the insulin in effect after that sugar is different from when you have an SSB. And SSBs do promote you to, they don't have that, that sated feeling. And so they promote you to eat more, um, just by virtue of, uh, of uh, the, the way that they're made up. Okay, so I know that you're a part of the Healthy Coalition um, Against Childhood Obesity. So has sugar, well, we know sugar is impacting the adults, but how has it been impacting our children? Have you got research that you've done on that that you can share with us? Yeah, so no, no I don't have the specific one on um, the children from in Barbados because the one that Dr. Harris did was in over 25s. Mm -hmm. um, what I, so we don't have the, the one that says, you know, this is a specific link to children in Barbados. But of course we know that our... Uh, uh, children uh, overweight and obesity, those rates are increasing. Um, we last thought 35%, but post COVID-19, now we are suspecting, if we are like the rest of the world, that they are, um, those rates are increasing. And anecdotally, what we want, we were about to start a, a study that's, um, that is already funded, but we're going to look at childhood disease surveillance again. But anecdotally, some of the pediatricians have been noticing that they are, um, uh, increasingly diagnosing type 2 diabetes in our children, um, especially since COVID. And that, that would follow then the pattern that is being seen um, internationally because there seems to be some uh, <clears throat> some correlation there with the COVID-19 and type 2 diabetes. It's something that we're watching. It is not uh, conclusive as yet, uh, but it, the, the anecdotal reports are there. And so we're, we, we are embarking on the study to look into it a little bit further. But it, it is something that is very concerning. So uh, what research are you carrying on at the moment, though? All right, so mm -hmm. the, the one I just spoke about was uh, the childhood obesity surveillance. Um, and we were funded to look at, um, at the, the numbers and where we are in terms of percentages mm -hmm. uh, and persons uh, and what's the surveillance like. That's one. Uh, we are, of course, always doing our monitoring in terms of heart attacks and strokes and knowing the levels there. So that's why we can uh, tell you that they are increasing over the past few years and, that, and that's a concern for us. But also we are very keen on implementation. So we are doing studies in churches. One study implementation was, was done by Dr. Kim Quimby um, and, and myself. We um, look into the churches and we have gone to the community. One, first of all, doing screening to help persons who don't normally go to the doctor to see if they have diabetes, if they have hypertension. So, so we're looking for people going into the community and saying, do you have these conditions? Do you have diabetes? Do you have high blood pressure? Come know your status. It is important to know your status so that you can do something about it. So once we found out what person's status are, we then, Dr. Kimby's side, Quimby's side of it, looked at, um, at uh, a what we call diabetes remission, where we put persons on a special diet um, and uh, to help control their diabetes. It was eight to 12 weeks of this very special diet um, that, they are, that they've been put on and that, that research, that paper is out there uh, that we did together. Um, and she's also expanding that to look at recipes. We looked at Bajan recipes, how people can just eat better and live better based on that <clears throat> low calorie diet. Um, we help them in terms of not, uh, some people did not then need the medication afterwards if they follow the specific diet that we have. Um, we are also looking at the hypertension person. So hers was, uh, was diabetes. I'm also looking at hypertension. Uh, we're running workshops again in churches, helping persons to understand and to manage their chronic condition and living a healthy life with a chronic condition. 
Uh, so those are just some of the implementation type of studies that we're doing here in Barbados. We're also doing implementation studies in other Caribbean countries with food, uh, with food gardens um, it, within schools and in food gardens within communities so that people are, again, learning how to manage their con these conditions and live a healthy life because of the same expensive foods that you're talking about, not just the Barbados, but you know, throughout the Caribbean and in our countries where we have high food import bills, uh, we were looking to see how can we reduce that food import bill and how can we um, eat more from the land and less ultra processed foods. So those are just some of the studies that we are doing, um, helping persons um, in terms of hypertension, in terms of if you have diabetes, so you do not move on to have a heart attack and you do not get registered within the registry. Um, you can live a healthy life with your diabetes, with your hypertension, and even before you get there, we're doing studies of foods as well. All right, we're going to take a quick break, but when we come back, we want to know what your research says about exercise. Something that you'd have to stick a piece of dynamite and light it under me in order for me to, to, to do it. But um, we could come back after the break and talk about the importance of exercise and take some more questions from our WhatsAppers. We'll be back. Welcome back to Face It and Fix It. We're speaking to Dr. Natasha Sobers Granham. Before the break, I mentioned about exercise. As our viewers can tell, I don't get into the gym very often and I don't exercise. But I can tell you what I do. I work from home and uh, when I go out, I, I actually I don't walk slow. Actually, my producer the other day, I was, we, we were going to a site and I just walk in and realized she was way behind me. Um, I have a tendency to walk very fast. Even if I'm in the house and I'm on the phone, I get up and I'm, and I'm doing work, I walk up and down. I walk up and down so I'm not sitting for long periods. I mean, that's the most I do. What does your research, if you have any research on exercise um, going on, if you can share that with us about the population as it relates to exercise, what have you found? Oh, uh, okay. So um, I'm calling out the whole of GACDRC this morning because Dr. Howitt, Christina Howitt, mm -hmm. she's done a lot of research on physical um, activity in Barbados. And I, so I just want to make that distinction, first of all, between exercise and physical activity. Uh, okay. Because what you are describing is, of course, physical activity. And so that's far more important than exercise, which is the structured, you know, going into the gym, you have a personal trainer, you're lifting weights. You're doing something that is sort of outside of uh, your sort of natural day to day. Um, and physical activity is what is really important. Uh, if you want to have get your physical activity from exercise, that's fine. But if you don't want to get your exercise, your physical activity from exercise, and you want to get it in a nat more natural way um, by going for a walk or you know deciding that you're going to park far from you know from uh, where you are working or you want to take a walk to the to the nearest shop rather than going to the big supermarket. Those are all uh, physical activity things rather than exercise per se. Um, but generally speaking, while uh, exercise is very, 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 very good for um, just about everything, heart, um, it is very good for your mental health. I mean, certainly that that's, anytime I think stress or you know something's going on, I go for a walk. And, and, and put in music because exercise is absolutely fantastic releasing endorphins it is really great for that some of the work that uh, christina has done of course shows that we generally don't have that much physical activity and uh, women uh, especially in barbados are high, very physically inactive so i think hers was 85 percent of women do not get sufficient physical um, activity which is uh 30 at least 30 minutes per day for five days a week i'm not getting that that general standard um 
but men are much more physically uh, active uh, in Barbados than the women. Um, and that's, that generally holds through uh, throughout the Caribbean as well. Mm -hmm. um, so we should be getting it. We know there are significant benefits for physical activity. I always say physical activity. Um, if you could work and be standing, that's also a good form. Uh, things that people don't think about when you're watching TV, you could be lifting weights because we think about physical activity, we think going walking, we think about cardio. But what's also very important are strength training exercises. So just sitting and you know, you're lifting weights, you're doing this, you're mm -hmm. lifting cans, something, those strength training exercises really, really important and flexibility as well. Just getting up and stretching for 10 minutes straight. Um, that, that is uh, very, very important. So strength training, flexibility, cardio, all very, very, very important. 30 minutes, at least five days a week um, is what we should be doing. Well, yeah, maybe I, or not generally. No, but I mean, honestly. I, I don't get that either. I don't. You don't, <laughs> I don't. Yeah. No, no I because I keep saying, I, I remember somebody sent me some gym clothes. I can't even tell you, like, this is leggings and this little exercise top. She keeps calling me and said, so did it fit? This is December. And I'm like, well, I haven't tried it on yet. I looked at it and I'm looking at my body and I'm going, that nah, ain't gonna fit. That ain't got enough stretch in it. I, I make jokes of myself because you know what? I, I am comfortable with how I look. Um, I know I'm big. I've got sumo wrestler arms. I say that. I don't wear arm holes, but does it mean that I'm unhealthy if you, if you get me? Because uh, we had this, this show on obesity and the fact that you know, bitches would say, man, look, she, she big bone. You know, some people, some people are big and still you have, have good blood have pressure. Different, yeah. And we have different mm -hmm. body sizes, huh? Mm -hmm. um, we have different body sizes. And one of the things, you know, that the research also shows is that there are people who are um, genetically predisposed to be bigger. Um, not that they, you know, that, that it will cause, you know, significant obesity or anything but there are persons who are genetically predisposed to be bigger we have different body sizes um so that i don't like to bring physical activity down to body size or obesity or so on but physical activity by itself um makes you healthier whether you lose weight or not uh whether and you know i encourage you to wear your arm holes whether you're wearing arm holes or not physical activity by itself is just a very good thing to do um it, it, it really does relieve a lot of stress and a lot of pressure. It makes your heart healthier. And it is also one of the ways that you can keep your blood pressure down. Uh, there are persons, very few, granted, I have very few clients like this, but there are persons who can help control their blood pressure on their physical activity alone, if they really stick to it and they're good uh, and, and they're very good about it. So um, yes, physical activity is not just about weight. It is by itself a very, very um, good thing. So basically, and sorry, yeah, can I also say the healthy sure. eating is not about weight, weight as well. The healthy eating mm -hmm. is by itself a very good thing because one of the things that Dr. Harris's um, study showed was the fact that we, even though we are overweight and obese, we, we are lacking some vital micronutrients, um, things like magnesium and so on. So we are not getting the, the types of foods uh, that we need. So there are persons who could be overweight, there are persons who could be normal weight and still they're not getting micronutrients that they should. So it really is about eating healthy and focusing on um, eating health rather than focusing on the weight necessarily. Because there are people who exercise and die. I mean, sorry to put it that way. They literally die when, I, I've known two individuals, one was playing squash, one was playing tennis, had a heart attack. I think what we don't know, obviously, is if they had some sort of heart uh, condition that they might not have even been aware of. Because, Absolutely. you know, we, we grew up, we used to hear this, but he got a large heart, and we don't know. I don't, you know, yes. bitches will term these things. We don't know the medical terms. But mm -hmm. you can have some heart defects that can impact you later in life that were not picked up at birth. Is that correct? Part of the study may show that it's not caused by eating bad or a lifestyle it's it's genetic yeah. it's, it's it's something um congenital mm -hmm. yeah i mean mostly when you find persons uh have, you know physical activity and then they collapse up suddenly mm -hmm. usually that is um related to a heart condition perhaps usually unknown sometimes known or uh, known to them not known to us generally um and you know so we shouldn't presume 
So again, going back to the importance of the population level versus thinking about the individual, because you, you can't think that um, you know exercising and eating healthy makes you immune from all things or immune from from every uh, condition. Um, you, you do it in and of itself. Like I said, if I'm feeling stressed, some, sometimes I just go for a walk. And I'm not thinking, oh, let me lose weight or let me look a particular weight or whatever. I'm thinking, I know that by the end of this walk, my endorphin levels will be higher and I will feel better today in the present um, and in the moment. Um, so again, that, I think that's, that's a, a, a positive way to, for us to think about it. Uh, I also saw, I don't know if you want a question on the thing about artificial sweeteners. I yes, mean, yes, it, artificial sweeteners. What are your thoughts on what, what does research yes. show? on artificial, right, artificial sweeteners. Mm -hmm. Right, so um, I, I saw that question, I had to smile because only last week um, there was a, a, a study that just came out talking about the linkage between the artificial sweeteners, unfortunately, um, and, and cancer. Uh, it's mm -hmm. not been, um, been um, re reproduced. It's just one study so far, uh, but you know those linkages we, we do have to be careful of uh, so it, again, it's just pushing us towards the natural, pushing us towards water, pushing us towards our, <clears throat> our coconut water and things that we're accustomed to and not thinking that we can necessarily have three sugar sweet and beverage or replace those three sweet drinks that we have with three diet drinks, right? So we should be thinking uh, to reduce all of those, um, uh, all of that consumption. So in the study, it was those persons who drink lots of diet drinks. It was those persons who had high consumption of artificial sweeteners that had an increased risk um, of cancer mm -hmm. so far. So it's something we have to watch. It is not like we can replace our um, sugar with the artificial sweeteners. You, do you also do research on the, the amount of amputees as a result of diabetes? Would that be part of your yeah. research? Yeah, yeah we, we haven't, yes, we, we haven't looked at that in, in quite some time. So I had a mm -hmm. student about three years ago and we looked at that as well and unfortunately, uh, those rates were also um, increasing in terms of the amputation. And, and, and that, of course, occurs when persons do not address uh, their diabetes quickly enough, uh, when, it, when persons do not address their uh, specific foot problem quickly enough. So if we are able to diagnose our diabetes early, as early as possible, uh, we are able to implement the things that we need to implement, like the better diet that Dr. Quimby was looking at like sticking to our medications, medication adherence is really important. Now we can live a healthy life with a chronic condition. We can have our type two diabetes and not progress to amputation, not progress to um, to the nephropathy, what we call the uh, and, and the neuropathies and so on and, and problems with our eyes because <clears throat> worldwide uh, visual loss between twenty five and seventy the most common cause with diabetic retinopathy, uh, which is you know a visual mm -hmm. loss because of the, the damage to the eyes. Uh, so we can prevent these things if we know our status, know if you have diabetes or not, and hypertension, and then manage it. Manage it with food, manage it with physical activity, manage it with medications, right? Uh, we have to stay away from them. Uh, we, we should really stick to the things that are proven as far as possible. Uh, I know that lots of people like to run to particular products and, and so on and so forth, but those products are one, not proven, and two, they also have side effects. So we have to be very, very careful uh, how we are managing our conditions. I can tell you I, I met uh, a person, uh, unfortunately he died um, 2021, um, last year, June. I didn't know him that well, but I was doing something for the QEH and met a few people. And he used to call me ma'am, he was in his 60s, and um, he had poor circulation, I guess. Feet, he needed an amputation, and they, and they had to do it like, literally the next day. He got to that stage. And he spoke to me, and he said, Ma'am, what should I do? And I'm thinking, well, I hardly know you. This is a decision that your family. So I, I just said, look, do you want to live? Uh, yeah. I said, well, then you're going to have to do it. But I gave him my word that support will be there, because that is also necessary when you get to the stage yes. that you will not be alone. And um, there's still pro prosthetics, um, yes. you know, for that. Yes. It depends on where they cut and all that type of thing. Unfortunately, um, there's an excellent program at the QEH hospital called the Transitional Care Program. 
and yes. and the but the problem is not the QEH, even though people come in on QEH, and we probably will later on in the show because we have something to share. That program depends on other agencies, like housing. If it's a, you know some some sort of changes that would have to be made before the amputee goes home, um, mm -hmm. national disabilities unit. Sometimes you need a ramp uh, into mm -hmm. the home, and, and and this person was was living was living was living in a housing unit. But we want you for a few more minutes. We're gonna take a break. Can you stay like for five more minutes and we'll be right back. Just five more minutes because and then we'll then we'll wrap up. But we'll be back after the break. We'll be back. Thank you. Welcome back to Face It and Fix It. We are continuing our discussion at NCDs with Dr. Natasha Sobers Granham. Before the break, we, we spoke about amputations and I was sharing something with you that the, the person uh, died, but um, I don't want to scare anybody into things, but the reality is that happens a lot more than we would like. When you don't do the right things and then you're, you, you're, you're diabetic and then sometimes you're not even taking the insulin or taking your medication or you're stealing a piece of sweet bread here but then you're adding it up with another sweet drink there and then something else there even though you're taking small bites of each the whole combination of everything that is wrong is on your plate and it is unfortunate that his life ended um, because of the amputation he didn't survive it and from what I understand, a lot of people don't survive. They survive maybe sometimes the first year. And sometimes they don't. So I just wanted to put that there for people who listening to us and the, the real stories that are there, even for myself, because this is therapy for me. When I leave this show and I'm going to like, hmm, should I go and get tested? Because my mom is a diabetic. My mom is hypertensive. My mom has kidney failure. My mom got heart condition. I mean, all of these things. And my dad uh, died 22 years ago from a massive heart attack. So when you add up the two, you're not looking too good either with your future if as a child, as the children, mm -hmm. probably are the ones that should go. But again, I just have a different take on how I do things. Uh, people, people do things for a pension plan. I and to, to talk about how their life and quality of life when they get older, I'm more looking at what I can do now to leave things in place for my children, in particular my daughter who is challenged. So I don't think about my life at 80. I don't think about my life at 70. I don't even think about dating. In other words, I just see my life as I do my work. I pray to God, keep me healthy. Truthfully, that's not what you should do. And I'm not telling people to do as I do. I'm just sharing what I do. And I don't want to hear that I am ill and then take myself out of that equation to not help my mother and to not help my daughter. People will say, but come on, Joy. If you want to be around, you should go. 
And I get that. I do. I understand. But when, I guess you've got to be in it to know it. Who feels it knows it. And you, your, your life is so taken up with looking after everybody else. And that happens to a lot of people who don't take the time to care mm -hmm. for themselves, who don't take the time to go to a doctor. So for me, I'm like, okay, well, my head not hurting and, and I'm not feeling sick. Why should I go? You know, there, there are people who are like that. Men, mm -hmm. I don't know if your study shows you that. Men don't run um, to doctors. Do you have that as part of your research? Um, for us in Barbados, we don't, we are, it, it comes out almost um, inadvertently in that mm -hmm. you would find that uh, when you're looking at the prevalence, it's always higher in women because our women are, are the ones who know that they have it. So we would look at, uh, we would ask persons, do you have hypertension? They would say, and it's, it's the women who say, yes, I know I have hypertension. And then you take the blood pressure, the, the, the rates are the same. So it means if the men have it as well, but they just didn't know that they have it. So they're, they're lacking in awareness uh, because they don't touch the healthcare system as, as much. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, I, you know, I completely agree with you in terms of the, the you know, the fear um, there, but you know, I, I really have to encourage you. And I, I, would, I, I want you to. Your who I says, want you yeah, to. I would, I would, I'd be like one of your friends who says, you know, think about if something happens and then then ones who are depending on you can't don't have anything to depend on because you are the rock. Um, so you, especially the rock, you have to uh, continue to be there. If you want to continue to be there, you have to also take care of yourself mm -hmm. because you are the rock. You are the person taking care of the younger and the older. And, you know, that's, I think, where we, uh, we are. Um, there are a lot of people like me out there. I can yes, tell you that. Yes. There are a lot of people yeah. who just taking care of the older, taking care of the, the older, younger, the, the younger. Time. And their Absolutely. job, Absolutely. charity and work, job at the same time. and they don't. Absolutely. Uh, but before we leave, I want to touch on mental health because you did say mm -hmm. that was part of it too. And it's NCDs, even, yep. Absolutely. yes, it's part of NCDs. It's something that I don't think we put on the front burner enough because I don't think we can get anything done in life if, if your mental health is not where it needs to be. Yeah. And even hearing the news that you have cancer or kidney failure, some or people diabetes. actually believe are diabetes. Some people, and um, again, probably this is why, if you're not strong mentally, if you don't have someone there or the doctor to say, um, we, we want to sit down for a second, because some people break news to you like if it was just, hey, by the way, you know what? You got cancer. They're, they're, not, they're not sensitive. And trust me, there's some doctors in Barbados that are not sensitive to even breaking the news that your baby has a problem, you know? so. How important is it for us to have the right, to be in the right space when you're about to get that news? I mean, do you go to the doctor to get the test and maybe talk to someone in between until results mm -hmm. come back? Is that recommended? Yeah, I mean, absolutely, 100%. So you're, you're, you're currently sort of speaking my language. When I, I, I just said I, I, um, I do a lot of work within the churches, and I often use James 5, if I may, in your program. James 5, please, 14, please, please. They're talking about, yeah, so, and it says, are you sick? So first of all, I say, James 5 says, are you sick? That means you have to know your status. You have to understand where you are. And then if you are sick, go to the elders, because guess what? We actually need support. We need in, in, if we, in with our diagnosis, if we have di so uh, diabetes, cancer, whatever it is, we should not really be dealing with these things alone. Go to your elders. But it also says praying for each other and supporting each other, specifically in that passage. So uh, we, and just to say that is a biblical tenet, but the, the interheart study, which is a medical study, it has, it has found that social support was one of the most important factors in determining a person's uh, cardiovascular mortality. If people had someone to go to the doctor with, somebody who, when you are there getting the diagnosis, the person is there next to you. Um, when you are, um, you need the support in terms of taking the medication, somebody's there and saying, oh, you know what? I, I'm gonna do this low salt with you because you know, low salt doesn't taste good. Let's face it, we're, we're hardwired and um, biologically wired to use sweet things and salt things and fatty things. So mm -hmm. sometimes we need the support even in our homes to help us be healthy. So it says, uh, you, are you sick? Then pray. You get the elders and use oil. What's the oil? The medication. 
the, the best available evidence. If the best available evidence is that you should be taking this tablet, then we should be taking it. If the best available evidence is that you should be walking, then you know you go for a walk or strength training or whatever it is. But we should be using the, these. Are, those are basic tenets. Know your status. Um, pray and get support. And prayer, the American uh, it's, it's family physician, American Academy of Family Physicians, said we should be writing prayer on our prescriptions because it also has been proven to help people through stress, help people through the same mental health um, conditions. It is very important for hypertension. All of these things are very, very, very important. Um, as important as the medication. You pray over your medication, pray and take your medication at the same time. These are ex exceedingly important things. And in the workshops, we go through things like guided imagery because we recognize that when people um, have a diagnosis, they are at increased risk then for depression, they're at increased risk because they're having pain and so on for, for feeling anxious and all that anxiety. So it needs to be holistic. The care that we give to people and the care that we give to ourselves needs to be holistic. Mm -hmm. Um, and prayer is included in that. Eating healthy is included in that. Physical activity is included in that. And social support um, and our family members also mm -hmm. included in that. I'm so glad that we were able to sort of end it on that particular note. And I made a note, James chapter, uh, chapter 5, chapter verse, five. verse 14. I think it's 14 to 16. 14 to no. 16. No, I'm making yeah, a note because I will say this. Only this morning, a friend of mine said, I told her what we were discussing. She said, Joy, you, you stress yourself to make, and make yourself sick. I believe that you can do the reverse and, and put mm -hmm. your mind in a positive way. So I came down the road this morning, like I normally do. I, I play mm -hmm. Happy by Pharrell and, I, and the windows open nice. and people probably thought it was crazy because the music up to all. And I am just dancing and dancing on my way to work. Now, if I have cancer, God forbid, I might not take it out. You know, but it puts you in a different mind because what people are saying is the diagnosis of just hearing is, mm -hmm. is in their opinion, and I believe this too, if you don't manage it, handle it mentally, it will kill you faster. Yes. You know, it Absolutely. will kill you faster. So Absolutely. we want to end on a good note of not only eating right, going to the doctor and get a check. Come on, Joanne, you got to do that. <laughs> but put your mind in a good yeah. space all right so mm -hmm. you want to leave on that positive note so i want to thank you so much i hope you do come back you've been such a tremendous help i'm sure because i i'm getting messages on my own phone um about this um information that you've shared and that we have to face our issues and and, if you it, can, fix and, it. and fix it if you can <laughs> fix it to, yeah. to make sure you have a better quality of life then that's what we do so maybe i'm halfway there maybe after you've spoken this morning perhaps i may take that step but i will let you know i will let you thank know. you all right thank, thank you for you. having me though thank you thank for you having too me. thank you <laughs> we'll be back after the break uh, we will be speaking with sharon sharon bellamy thompson after the break we'll be back
Welcome back to Face It and Fix It. It's always a breath of fresh air when you meet people who just dedicate their life to service, to serving others. And this person that we are going to talk with today is none other than Sharon Bellamy Thompson. Most of you might have seen her on CBC's news or other newspapers talking about feeding the homeless. And it's, it is my pleasure to have a discussion uh, with her today. And I might note, also note, that she is the winner of the MCTV's uh, COVID uh, award and um, I guess doing a heroic service in terms of she's um, an everyday hero, I would say. Welcome to the show, Sharon. Welcome. Welcome and good morning, Miss Hayes. Good morning. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. Good. Now, um, I want you to give us a little background about yourself and how you got involved in feeding the homeless and giving your life to service. How many years? How did it start? More than 30 years, I'm 50 years old now, and uh, I was doing this from the time I was like five years old, I remember, because my mother, Maureen Bellamy, she always used to have a big pot of cooking and serving others. And um, like when the neighbors come over, they will come and say, um, they don't have anything to eat that time. My mother, she was not there. And I would go to her in that time, it was larders, and I would have taken out everything and give to the neighbor. Okay, we, we're fixing a technical problem now, Sharon, so give us one second and we will um, try to get back to you um, as soon as we get that sorted. But we do have something to share that was put on Facebook, um, a problem at the, uh, uh, someone shared uh, a, a problem that yes. they had yes, exactly. at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. Yes, and yes, we know the QH is doing all that they can, but there are some situations where they don't and um, people share that information on social media. Uh, we do have Sharon back now with us and we certainly will share that right after we speak with her, that person's experience at the accident and emergency. So Sharon, back to you. You were telling us again about that larder. I heard that name for a long time, boy. Yes, I, yes, the I larder. Was small child, six mm -hmm. years, five, six years old. I, being a customer, seeing my mother Maureen Bellamy cooking big pots and serving others, you know, that stuck with me. So one day she went out shopping and a neighbor came over, a little child like me was crying. Partly she came looking for my mother, but my mother was not there. She said her mother wanted something for them to cook. So I went into the larder and um, my mother just had barely enough for us and I gave it to her. And then when my mother came back home now, um, it was lashes, I said, mother, but I accustomed seeing you feeding others. So the little girl came over crying, so I gave her what we had there. So I, I, know, I know not started it. It was in my genes from the time I was a little child. It's almost like you knew exactly what God wanted you to do. Yes. So exactly what group of persons, which group of persons do you focus on? Do you focus on persons who are sick? But I believe that you focus on homeless persons. Is that the only group of persons that you focus on right now in terms no. of your feeding program? No, it really started with the kids because I'm a lover of kids, though I only have one. Thank God for that because I think if I had more than one, I couldn't focus on that. But it really started with the kids, you know, and still I'm dealing with the kids because I usually have outings. But since COVID came in, I was unable to take the kids out because I used to do like five parties a year, like to the Hilton and Catamaran Cruises, um, outdoor parties and stuff like that. But since COVID stepped in, it was more as to the homeless, you know, because they were on the road and I needed to deal with them as well. But I still do the kids because not only do I feed every day, I do a lot of hampering, like um, take hampers to home all like yesterday, every day of my life is just busy. So tell me what a, a regular day is like in terms of you get up in the morning, this is your job, I mean, do you, I mean, I said it's not your job, I mean, you're giving your life to service, so how does your daughter and everybody fit into this busy schedule that you have? So what well, is a typical day for you like? I wake every morning at three, but on Sundays oh. I wake at two because on Sunday it is more. Because what I normally do every day, I do a cook-up. 
but on Sundays, you know, like me and probably you, we like to have our macaroni pie and our vegetables at the side and our baked chicken and stuff like that. So on Sundays now, I have to put out 110 rice, then I have to go back to it, then to put on the macaroni pie, the steamed vegetables, the, the baked turkey and stuff like that. Yeah. So how many days a week, is it seven days a week? You do Every it? day of my life, I give service to the poor. All right, so you get up, you get the food ready, then what happens after that? Where do you go? Um, How do they receive the food? Yes, well, uh, my journey starts from Grisettes, where I live. I come down with There's transport, some. and I dropped off Batsis Road. Sharana food looked good, though. Then I... <laughs> then food I, looked really good, girl. Then I, <laughs> then I go up to town, and then I come back and stop by Hero Square. And this is, this is for lunch? Yes, lunch and breakfast, everything in one. What I do is mm -hmm. every day is a meal, and then I also have bread from Carter's Bakery, which, at, it, which I put tuna, cheese, corned beef, lunch with me, and that um, 110 breads every day, then with their cooked meal, and then a hot beverage. Wow, so how do you get all this transported? Uh, who, who helps you? Because we're going to get into the getting you help in terms of what you may need because you know I, I told you to make some requests because this is a pretty big operation and it's getting bigger yes. so how do you get everything done in the morning well um at the moment i don't have transport but um my brother he helps me out and you know but i'm looking forward in getting a vehicle because what happens at night Sometimes, most of the time, sometimes I'm on the road and I would have to call like some person to like transport me. Sometimes I have to wait for them. My problem is with me. Um, I don't like to wait because when I hear like people don't have food for the kids, you know, I want to move right now, right now. Yeah, but sometimes I have to wait. I go as far as St. Lucie, St. Peter, you know, where there's a need, you know, because when children are hungry, mothers, you know, prefer to stay hungry than to have their kids being hungry. So we just saw a picture with persons in the line there. How many people roughly do you feed a day? Uh, um, over, you said over 100? Over 110 every day. The numbers are climbing? Yes, and the numbers are climbing, so um, I put in extras. Would you see children in those lines, or the parents would just come and the take parents them? will come. Sometimes the children will come, or um, I would drop off the kids one or stuff Well, like I was going to ask you about that because I, I do know that there was a, a story recently of a couple uh, living in a car, and um, I, I know that they, it was drawn to your attention, and that couple that story broke, I believe, before COVID. I, 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 I believe it was before COVID or just when COVID started. And unfortunately, that couple is still living in the car. And I believe that you had an encounter with that couple as it was drawn to your attention yesterday. It was, it was Sunday. Yes. Only Walk me through what happened. Don't have to call names of who called you. Yes, I wouldn't. But just tell me what happened. Hold, what, what happened yesterday? Because I um, was floored when I heard w what you did, honestly. Yes. Even what made me cry. Um, Girl, we've been crying all day today. Let's get some tissue in here, producer. I, we'll had, get some um, tissue. Finish. I had finished my daily preparation of going to the poor and stuff like that. And I was getting ready to go to bed. I think it was around 2.30, quarter to 3. And I saw this number, but I didn't know this number. But anyhow, I answered the number. And it's, the person says, is this Sharon? Can I speak to Sharon? I said, this is her. The person said, um, do you deliver lunches? I said, um, no, I don't really deliver, but I, I go to a particular area. And it has, I am finished, and I'm home, getting ready to lay down. And the person said, well, um, I'm hungry. Um, they say, um, I just want to share this with you. Um, um, we live in a car, me and my girlfriend. And, we hadn't eaten for the day. I was like, oh my God. I said, okay, give me a few minutes. I'll call my friend, Tricia, who works at United Insurance. And as I call her, I got, before I called Tricia, I got up because I had no more food. All I had left back was like two pieces of chicken. I believe God had them for them left back. I had some gravy, but the other stuff, like the vegetables would be in the fridge. So I got up and I start to cut up and cook them some green pieces. Before I even heard Tricia, 
I started to do what I had to do, and then I called and she said, no problem. So I tell them that um, I will be there shortly. And I, I got her, and I said, but before that I said, man, I got cook something quick for them, like um, spaghetti. Then they said, oh no, she wanted this Sunday. And I said, what I would have liked for myself or my family or my friends today is Sunday, and no, sure, I got to give them some rice. And I cook up that. If you seen it, it, it was, it, 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 you know, I couldn't go to sleep. And knowing that that couple live in a car and had nothing to eat, not only did I took it, I took some juice and I made sure that they had enough for the next day. You, even though they were in the car, I didn't know where they would have put it, but I made sure. And when I got there, and I, I, I was even brought to tears because the lady, she didn't want to come out of the car. It was a gentleman who was speaking. I took a big, large bottle of Marby for them. I took cups and a few snacks and stuff like that. And I, I was crying all the way because I was like, what is this? And as I went into the neighborhood, there were lots of houses there. And I was saying to myself, people don't really have a heart like me because I know like, some people going to bed, you know, they wouldn't mind what he was saying, how hungry he was. He would have to wait for tomorrow, but never do Sharon Bellamy do that. I try to fix every need, and that was an urgent need yesterday. And when I got there, they were in smiles. They thanked me so much, and I said, well, thank God, because God is who provides everything, and, you know, I would be there. Yeah, I couldn't wow. stay home, and just leave them home. Yeah, because I heard about it yesterday and uh, you know you had already finished delivering and doing your thing and you didn't have anything else and then you didn't you you, you just couldn't sleep you know to, to, and I, I, I commend you for that I, I, I you. really do um, I want to talk about though the the persons that I, again I saw on the line everybody is not homeless is it that there's some people who have somewhere but they don't have food have you encountered persons that say to you, listen, I have somewhere to live, but I don't have any food in the house. I come for a meal. Do you see that? Or is it just homeless yes, persons? Yes, yes. It's a lot of that too. And then there's a lot of people, you know, sometimes people try to deter me, but they get to realize that Sharon don't watch face because, you know, sometimes you can be dressed and, and broke. And it happened to me already hey girl, to because I was dressing... Pretty. A lot of us, yes. we're dressed, we try to keep ourselves, but doesn't mean yeah. that we, we are, are not. You know, so, you know, people watch mm -hmm. people at face value, so, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes they're barely working for enough. Then it was a family situation, a husband, a wife, and he had to leave the home and stuff like that, you know. So I don't deter no person because you don't know people's circumstances. And then COVID came to show us that, you know, you can't look down upon persons. Never would I want to look down on a person. I remember when you made the news with the COVID situation and you, you know, you just got right back out there again. Yes. You did what they asked you to do, you know, tested and whatever, and you were right back out there again. Now, how do you get all of this mm -hmm. food to help all of these people? I'm sure there are people out there watching you now, wondering that question and how can they help you? But so how do you get this food? All of these donations? Corporate yes. Barbados? Well, first, let me say, um, when God told me to go into this, like, seriously, well, I was always into it seriously, but he was like, feed the poor. I took up all of my money, had into the bank, leaving me, actually broke. And what I like about God, he, he, he don't want help. He don't want others to help. Like, you know, a person that I would have looked to, that I taught, that would have helped me, you know, everybody turned about. But then I got to realize that God wanted to get all the glory for himself. So then, as when the money left, God sent some great sponsors. I have the, um, I want to say a big thank you to the Honorable Bertram Hall. You know, he was by my side even before I was formed as a charity. Then I have Carter's Bakery, then the Sandy Lane Charitable Trust, the Amaronable Charitable Trust, which is called Dave. And at the Sandy Lane, I want to say a big thank you to Miss Chalice and to Nikki. These people were terribly alongside of me and trying to, you know, they're bringing me vouchers. Whatever people give to them, they're saying, well, Sharon, you're the appropriate person for this, you know. So I have a lot of great sponsors who work alongside of me, even through COVID. I mean, the donations, you know, like they say, um, storms come to put you down, but storms and um, pandemic there came to make me better because I've seen a lot of persons donating and donating and keep donating. Like 
Massey stores and Massey um, Hanchelin is here the other day. Hanchelin sent me over a couple of days ago 100 bucks of cornflakes. The other day Massey sent me 150 bags of potatoes. I was like, oh my God, where would I have all this storage? But as I packed the hampers, I was giving each family a bag of potatoes. They can make cream potato, they can make chips, a lot of things the potatoes could have done. Wow. Girl, I love you. I can tell you that I love you. I Honest love you to too. God, I love you. So, okay, we're going to take a break. When we come back, someone asked a question about the Homeless Society and if you work alongside them. So, we will ask you that question when we come back after the break. Welcome back to Face It and Fix It. We are speaking with Sharon Bellamy Thompson. She is the founder of Fishers of Men Charity. And this charity was set up by Sharon in an effort to assist persons uh, basically with, with getting a, a meal on a daily basis. So not only if you're homeless, but if your situation that you found yourself in, uh, you couldn't eat. Um, she just reached out to them and just say, come, um, I'm not going to forget you. And um, before the break, I asked her about, where do you store all of this things? So she just listed out a whole list of things. And so she told me, and I wanted to share that with you. So Sharon, when you get all of, all, all of these items, what happens? Where do you get to store these things? Well, right now where I'm living has become too small, but I have a storeroom which I made into one of the bedrooms. Then they're down through the aisles. They're every corner of my house that you can think about. So in order for you to, to, to be of better service and manage this a lot more, what exactly would you like, uh, where would you like to see this charity go in terms of a building? And, and having somewhere to store. What yeah. is your wish? Yes, for many years I, was being, I have been saying it that I need like a building, whereas not only I can cook from it, that I can have the persons living there as well, a shelter, the kitchen where everything will be there because I really have some great big plans for a shelter. So you want a plan, you have a plan for a shelter, but then there's the shelter that we have there for the homeless society. Do you? work closely together um, when you do your program and just be honest I mean yeah, just tell so us. I was just going to tell you that to be honest well you know um, I was in this for like as I told you as long as I was living and but more so like 30 years and every morning I get up at two o'clock and I don't see any person in my kitchen with me even with the preparation which I start my preparations we work at the Bridgetown fish market every day if you pass you will see me cutting up you will see me chopping up 
in preparation. So I don't think that um, I should do all of this preparation myself and then take it to somebody else's shelter. Mm -hmm. I don't think so. Reality. Okay. So there's no real re relationship between the two? No, uh, because, you know, reality, I'll say, um, I don't know for what reason, but he don't like me and I don't know for what reason because I can't feed all, him can't feed all. True. Um, spoken like a true Bajan, I recommend you for your openness, right? Um, so it's something we can also look at later on, but let's get back to, 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 to all of the things that you re request um, for in order for this to be more successful. So you're looking at the building, so what steps have you taken to sort of ask for this building? Are you in discussions with anybody or today is the first day you're making this decoration on face and fixing it? You no, I have made this decoration for many, many, many years, but and then they have person who will say, Sharon, we will try to help you look for this building. Some mm -hmm. are say, Sharon, it's on the way. I'm going to make sure that you get this building because that is my dream. You know, I have people who have kids who I had to, they were actually in the same shelter and I had to go rescue them. They were calling me and they wanted meals because they said to me that um, their children didn't used to eat that or the children came in and it was too late and there was nothing. So then I had to venture out then for them to come out to feed them and stuff like that. But, you know, and when I get this building, I'm sure it would be the best, you know. And then sometimes I hear a lot of stories, which I really don't want to hear stories. I am focusing upon me that, you know, mornings they have to get it at an X amount of time to come up. But me as a woman, you know, on certain times of the year, on the, of the month, you don't want to get up and but they have to get up and get out at a certain time. Then they have to walk with the luggage. I don't believe in nothing like that. You know, mm -hmm. I'm a realist and I believe that, you know, you're in a situation, you're done homeless then for people to come then it's, that's supposed to help you then push you into a deeper hole. You know, I don't like that. So I, I uh, even last night when I was coming back from the couple, I was talking to my friend Tracy and I told her that like all like this over here now, me and my people and you, cause I ain't living yo. We will be down by the shelter, and I will be popping popcorn. They will be having ice creams. You know, bring them back to life. Things that they are never had in a long time. Because some of these people too were persons who were in homes, came out of great homes, and you know, like drugs. And as I said before, different circumstances push them out. You know, so you know when you down and out, and then for you to be trampled upon by some person who's supposed to be helping you, you know, mm -hmm. it, it puts... It lures you even it, more yeah, in your dignity yes, and yeah. you're already out on the streets. And yes. So, so the persons that, uh, again, do you feed it's, it's drug addiction for some? Is it just family, family, problems, family problems? Then some um, return mental nationals, mm -hmm. some mental health. So, you know, I love them so much. They become my kids sometimes. They have somebody in the 80s and they call me their mother. So I, I know what is a mother. So one day I asked one of the gentlemen who's 83, I said, uh, why you call me mommy? He said, because only a mother don't care what her children do or what, what he say. She can make sure every day that he eats. And, and I know that what it meant, but I wanted to hear it from an 82 year old person. And I'm so happy, you know, it's a joy getting up every morning. You know, I don't have a salary coming from that end, but it's a service to God because he's told me to feed the poor, to feed them, and, and, and you know, it's a blessing. And I feel so energetic at 50, you know, some people say, and to me too, that I look like 20 something, and I believe it is the work that I do. People wanna know, Sharon, how you get that managed, how you can get up at three o'clock every morning, but it's a service to God. Well, you got me there because I, I you know, there's a saying that, um, but managing your time and trying to do everything, you know, at the same time, you've got to be careful that you don't get things done because, but you're able to manage it some yes. or the other that you get up, you get everything prepared yeah. and um, you get any time for yourself? Um, not really. No, I know too. I have um, been into the gym, so it pushed me. Because when I go home on evening... You get time from, to go into the gym? Yes, I'm going to the gym. Yeah, Girl, you going to tell me how you're doing it? Because I yes. never get... Well, as the early yes, discussion, I, I wanted to do it. To yeah, I wanted mm -hmm. to do it for a long time, but I was mm -hmm. studying. Sharon, you got to go home and pay 110 breads. So I had to um, ask God. I said, God, help me. But, 
it pushed me like two hours back behind my schedule. So when I come from the gym, then I go clean up myself and then I paste the hundred and something breads and it, it becomes easier. It comes, it's so easy and so natural and I'm feeling energetic. Now I'm into the gym, I'm feeling so energetic and you know, everything is working good because I do it all for these people. Not one day have I ever gotten up and say, oh Lord, Sean, I'm so tired. God, just give me the strength. I remember a couple of days ago, like it was oversleeping. I swear to God, Mrs. Hay, I heard a voice here, Sharon get her, and I jump and I look all around, but I was running a little bit late. So that was God prompting me to get up. And what about the transportation? I know you said you need a building. You need somewhere. Your dream is to have a building. and. Trans you're, what you're saying is, is that we have one, but there's room for two because we see a lot. I'm telling you, COVID has pushed out even more people out there yes, on the streets. A true. lot of people are homeless, mm -hmm. or if they're not homeless, they're not getting a proper meal. Yes. So you, you, you need a building. So to our viewers out there with a little income, a little bit more money than us, yes. um, certainly we're going to put that out there for you. But a vehicle. Something yes. that you can brand the name yes. of the Fishers charity. of Men and the person Fishers who will give it men. to me. Right now I have um, home, my guy Wakarda, a, a great sponsor to me too. Mm -hmm. He just wrote out some letters and I didn't even know I would be on this show. He just wrote out some letters to like five car dealerships. So I'm in the process of dropping off to see, not to see because I know what God told me that someone has to give me a vehicle. So. Mm -hmm. Everything that God has told me, I have seen, came to pass. And the vehicle is nothing for a company to give to me to give back to the work. For sure, their name would be on the, on the vehicle, Big and Bull, whoever donated it. You know, it's not for Sharon Bellamy, mm -hmm. but it's for the service of God, you know, to get mm -hmm. to more people because, you know, so many people need me and I cannot reach all at the same time. But and I do reach them. But done. Yeah, because when, I, when the vehicle is by me, I can pack everything and I can go from point A to point B. I remembered um, when it was COVID, I request a pass and not one person have come and give me a pass. So I remember Admiral Nelson was saying on the radio, you know, he speaks, he, he doesn't hold back his mouth. And he was saying, but how comes it you all never give Sharon Bellamy a pass and this woman do all this work? And I venture out and... You know, even when I was staying, I, I, I never stayed and I was all in St. Andrew. I remember going to St. Andrew in the night, like minutes to one o'clock. And I'm telling you, Miss Hague, that God was so good that I have never even butt up on a police vehicle. And I remember, and, and I remember a guy told me one day that he was on the road after hours. And when the police stopped him, he said, um, um, I just went and dropped off some hampers for Sharon Bellamy and that was a total and they said okay so I said if he can do that and I am the founder and the person who's doing the work I never I never stopped going out and and the thing about it is God always had my back I never even um, contracted COVID thank God for that and I, I will never contract it and I mean like when it was on the road all of those nights late nights 11 o'clock 12 o'clock because you know, when the phone ring and the WhatsApp messages come through, Sharon, I need something for my children. I just pack them in my friend Jamea car or whoever car. Sometimes they go with it and we travel to these people and not one day have we ever seen a police. So I thank God for that. So all of that was God word. But if they approach me, I believe that they would have let me go because each and every person know what Sharon Bellamy does in this Barbados. I, I will say to you on the God end, when your will is aligned, you know, it comes together, God's will, it does like this, uh, and the yep. doors just start to open up. It's and it's an amazing feeling, and I, I encourage people to find, find their passion, what, what you've been put on earth to do, and certainly it's sound that you have been put here on earth to do that. And... It, it makes it easier for you because this is what you are this is i believe you're born to do this and i think you know that and i share those thoughts with you because i often tell people you never give up you keep trying you keep trying you can get kicked down seven times you get up eight you know but there's a time when you realize that if you're doing everything right and nothing is happening to bring that dream, that goal to fruition, it means that you make the wrong turn. It is not God's will yes. for you. Because yep. 
it ain't lining up. Yep. You could That's be doing true. everything, everything right and it's raising true. all the job applications. You want this, I want that, I want this. And you realize so this door ain't opening up by doing it's everything not God's right. Will. Always remember, it's not God's will. Yes, and if it ain't God's will, stop. Recognize that you've done everything, but it's not happening. Because there's a difference between you just feel this burning in your belly. You know when it right. Yes, you know? it's true. It's you know true. that this is for you. So even you get kicked down seven, seven times, times yes. you're still getting back up. Because in your stomach, in your gut, you just know. So, but there's a time where you, you're doing things, and you ain't getting the way, and you ain't feeling that passion in, in, your, in your stomach. Yes, you're going I'm going to share with you. When you're, you're, doing, you're doing the wrong thing. But I, I want to encourage you, though, because I want to get to the award that CBC gave you in terms of how you felt when you, when you got it. But are you going in the direction of, of setting up the charge in a way? Because if you're going in the direction of a building and a car, you, you, are you going to set it up officially? Or you have it officially registered? Yeah. Yes, I, I, board I did, yeah. and yes. You know, all of those things that you may need some assistance with because you're, you're growing now. Yes. There's no longer Sharonda with things in the living room. It's Sharonda <laughs> with things in the living room, the corridor, yeah. all the and bedrooms, everywhere. you know, and, and everywhere that you can think. So you're actually doing things I now. even left to buy your cucumbers in the front house this morning because <laughs> I remember yesterday when it was like dozing off before the people called me, mm -hmm. I heard a car blowing and I peeped outside, but I know I wasn't expecting a person, but I saw a little vehicle and then I went back because I didn't hear no name because I believe if you wanted me you should have come and knock and I went back in but then um, one of my helpers who actually lives there he went out and he said mommy a bag of cucumbers was out there when I went I saw them so I brought them in and put them right there in the front house mm, okay yes. so well um, we gonna we gonna well we don't have to take a break I thought I thought we did soon but we will continue the conversation because um, I want to put it out there again because I have to repeat. For those of you who might have missed it, Sharon needs, the, the, the charity needs a vehicle, preferably a van, right, Sharon? Correct, yes. We, we, we're requesting, and I say we because we at Face It and Fix It, we are also making a plea on her behalf. So to our friends at all of those lovely car dealerships, whether it's Simpson Motors, Courtesy Garage, Platinum Motors, yes, I'm calling your names out. And even a person who may have uh, what we call a reconditioned uh, vehicle, there may be some person with a vehicle, a van that's two years old, and they want to donate it. So it doesn't have to be a car dealer. It could be somebody that has three vehicles, and clearly you cannot drive all at the same time. So Sharon would be very happy if you would share so that happy. and, and donate that vehicle. I'm making a plea now on her behalf. Um, she needs to get up there a lot more to be able to help persons who are in need. We have so many people, um, even more so because of COVID, and um, Sharon is there to help. So see if you can, you know, talk to your friends, call somebody right now because you know you're watching this and you said, you know what, John got three vehicles there in that van there, so he got all it needs is a battery. Perhaps, you know, you know, it could fix it up. We're not talking about something old, because if you're not going to use it, certainly do not donate it is my policy. Yeah, my policy too. But if it is good enough to use and you know that you can use it and it's a great vehicle and it's still in good working order, perhaps you can do that. So you got an award, I understand it was last week. Oh, it was yes, the please. MCTV COVID Hero Award. How did that feel? Um, it felt great, you know, it had added an, again to my numerous awards that I had and I was really appreciated because I, I really didn't know so much about that but then a lot of persons had called me and said they had nominated me and they were getting, um, when they called and they were reading it out to the persons that the persons was actually into tears as well because they talk about everything that I did for them and not only for them, for other, other family members and stuff like that. You just have to call Sharon and she is there. I'm telling you, I don't care how tired I am. When is a need out there for children, big persons, whatever. But mostly at night, the request is just be like for kids. You know, as I saw a photo there just now with me, that was a couple back in Jackson. And, you know, and it was like seven of them in the house. Um, the youngest was a twin, you know. 
from the time I, I heard that I told him give me 10 minutes and again I called my girl Tracy from United Insurance and she was there ready. I mean, she don't ask for the gas money. She don't have gas. Tricia she deserves an award too. Yes, she, she, yes, yes a award. I've never good, seen good Tricia you. from you, Massey yeah. United Insurance. Um, Props to Tricia. You know, yeah, she, a great girl, yes. She never, you know, she would go there and she would swipe her car and fill up the car. And she said, Madam, where are we going first? Yeah, I, I mean, mm -hmm. she's always there because when we went and because I took out two, um, three bags yesterday as well too. And I tell her, will we go feed the people first and then we will go and drop off these um, hampers for families. And I mean, when I got to the persons, they were not looking for me. They start to cry. There was like, Sharon, God said, you. I said, yes, I move by the spirit. I do what God said to do, no matter what it costs, because God never going to take me on the wrong path. So never basically did. you need uh, some, uh, well, you have some assistance, I would imagine. Yes, of, yes. I have Tricia people. being one of them. But if you're growing and you are growing, you probably would have to get other people on board to, to make sure because in all honesty you can't do this all by yourself oh, yes it's and, true and but god give for right now god give me the strength for this end right now but and i tell him so i said god i'm going forward i'm getting bigger so you need to send the building you need to send the purses and i know that god will do because i remember as i told you i had i had actually nothing to cook and i used to cry with put on as you know about God, I would put on the pot with the time and the water boiling. And I want to say to you, Miss Miss Haig, that God oh, has joy, been please. good joy. God mm -hmm. has been, I mean, extremely good. No, not only now do I have rice to cook for the homeless, but I have rice to give to to families. You know, from from lack to abundance. So you were just saying that just now, from lack to abundance. Not only can I cook, but I can feed many other families. And I thank God for that. That was just a God move. Amen. He gave me the vision, then he set the provision. Um, you know, I'm not trying to turn anybody into Christians or whatever. I, I'm not a Christian, but I believe in God. Because yes. I will say this to you. I don't give myself, I've said it before in this show, I've said it in other shows, I will never give myself that title because I don't think I'm worthy of it. I think God will have to, when he meets me, he'll have to tell me joy. You walk the walk, you talk the talk, you are a Christian. All I can do is humble myself and do what I would want for myself for others. That's how I yes. live. I do not harm. If I can help you, then don't harm you, you know. Just sometimes you can't do every, obviously you can't do everything. Yes. But, um, and I said that because, you know, we're talking about the Bible and I do read. Sometimes, I, not, I can't tell you that I am this Bible, whatever, expert, but... I go with what God tells me. I don't read the Bible to figure it out. I talk to God to figure it out because I don't lean on to my own understanding. Okay. Every time I do something for somebody, it's not me. It it's never God. has been me. It's yes. God, God doing that. And every time I accomplish anything for someone, I look up and I go, oh, thank you, Lord. Yes. You know, thank you because that's how he works. He's got soldiers on the ground. Yes, You're yes, a soldier yes. of God. Yep. And uh, that's how we do what we do. And we encourage people um, to do that. Um, I have one more question about uh, persons. If, if, some, if people have a home and they're living in, in a house, but they just have no food, can they call you? I mean, of course, certainly. But how would you get there? You deliver? Because I know you deliver to the individuals through Tricia. It was yesterday. Yes, yes. Because you, obviously you need to get transportation. And every other time last Sunday, we were down in St. Lucie, we were down in St. Peter. Mm -hmm. A lot of, yes, a lot of these families too. Um, the person where we went by last Sunday, the, the children, the lady has four grandchildren, she don't work, she can't hardly walk, and the children's father, he had died in an accident, the mother had died the previous year, so we had to get there. Yes, okay. and thank God for Tricia every day, I thank God for her. All right, I want you to, last words of you to wrap up, what you want to tell Barbadians again about your work, what you need. Um, keep it short and sweet. Yes. You look right into that camera and yes. you said, fishers of men, this is what we need to help the persons on the ground to get them food. What do you need? 30 seconds yes. to tell us. Um, I want to say thanks for listening to me. And at this moment, I'm in need of a building and a vehicle so I can do the work of God better all right and if i can elaborate a little bit on that for those of you now joining sharon feeds hundreds of, over 100 people every day 
homeless people, people who don't have anything, even if they're not homeless. She's been doing this at it over 30 years. So she's not here to just say that, oh, I, I, you know, Jesus loves you and I'm the church and everything. She actually combines God with what she does. And she's guided by God, obviously, to do this. So I'm encouraging you, if you can, help her, continue to help her. I'm begging you all for a vehicle, facing a fix it, asking companies or anybody right now. I know some of you responded when we needed a home for someone, and you did. I'm asking for a nice van for Sharon, and we can then work on the building. Thank you so much, Sharon, for coming. God bless you. We love you. We encourage you to do every day at dawn. Again, girl, if they kick you down seven times, get up here. Yeah. Okay? Yes, thank Always you, Joy, remember and that. Thanks to CBC for having me. Thank you so much. We'll day. be back yeah, God bless after the break. Welcome back to Face It and Fix It. So I'm here checking my phone and there are people who are responding to my phone to get more information about um, Sharon. And I want to thank that person. I don't know if it will come to fruition, but again, it's always good for people to reach out. A lot of people actually uh, do watch this show. I'm surprised the other day, Auntie Kathy had, was walking sky down the road and the person said, is that the lady from Facing the Fix's daughter? Because we featured Sky. And then she said she got the same thing going down um, on the main road. She got the same thing too as well. So I was just looking for something that came up on social media. And I probably, I can't read all of it. But um, the person was actually talking about their experience at the accident and emergency. And the fact that they spent over 12 hours and no one said anything to them. Um, the, the child did not get any attention, not even an assessment. Um, the person experienced a lot of pain, and um, they just said they just they saw different people, different nurses, even looked them in the eye to get a response, and they're actually very upset because they're thinking um, should we have hired uh, some of these people and I'm believing that he mean in some of the staff because he felt that it, they may not have treated him and his child in the right place and again people who are, are angry would say things like that this went up on social media and um, he, he's saying is this the best we can do in 2022 is basically the whole crux of that story It's quite long but again as a parent horrified now we spoke about NCDs and we talk about prevention. Right now the Queen Elizabeth Hospital is in a, in a serious state because they're overwhelmed um, by the amount of persons coming in with NCDs. I believe that there were some people who, 
who were on Facebook trying to say, listen, COVID is not everything. And no one, some people weren't listening. COVID took over everything. It just sucked the oxygen out of the room. It did. But while COVID was happening, people were suffering from diabetes and it was getting worse, kidney problems, heart problems, all kinds of things. And now that we have lowered um, some of the restrictions and there's more movement, um, people now see other people like, you know, more sick than before and it's not COVID. And now we're trying to throw our attention to NCDs. As you know, the government has put Dr. Sonia Brown um, at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in charge of NCDs. And um, I believe that we hopefully will like to have her on a show. We will pursue that because we have to put this on the front burner. Everything is not about COVID. And I can tell you that my daughter's granny, Girly, uh, she's no longer with us. She died 2020, June uh, 2019. And up to this day, no one can convince me that the fact that COVID was around, uh, she did not get the care that I believe that she should have gotten. Um, but then again, it wasn't even COVID because she should have gotten the care of two years before she probably died. But that's another story. But you, you learn from your experiences. It's unfortunate that she had to die in order for me to see certain things. And the Queen Elizabeth Hospital really does need some help. And I think that they need for us to also look after ourselves a bit better, be a bit more proactive when it comes to our health. Understand that when you go there, it's, it's, it's almost like, and I, I'm guilty of this too. I got my vice. I do things that are not healthy for me. But remember, when you constantly do something that is not healthy for you, and you run into the hospital, and 300 people at the same time doing the same thing, and all land in the accident emergency, imagine how overwhelmed the hospital will get. So even though the hospital have their problems, and God knows I know that they could do better, and they have a lot of things that need fixing. We get that. But on the same hand, Barbadians, we need to do everything that we can to keep ourselves out of QEH, especially now. There is no room at the inn in, in terms of if three and 400 people arrive at the same time, because then you have a lot of people on the wards that you can't, obviously you can't discharge them. So you understand what the bind is, so please, Take care of yourselves as much as you can. Me too. I don't do it. I'm going to try. I'm going to try hard. You know, and if for some reason I don't get it done, I'm going to make sure that my children don't fall into the same trap that I, I, that I have. And I'm hoping that you do the same for your children. Keep out of Queen Elizabeth Hospital as much as you can by trying to eat the right foods, try to exercise, do your checks, check your sugar, check your blood pressure, and laugh as much as you can. Watch good movies, relax, do the things that will keep your mind healthy. Because when you don't, you're expecting a doctor to create a miracle. After you have done so much damage to your own body, then you get angry with nurses, you get angry with doctors because you have now to wait. 12 hours. Now, I'm not saying everybody, Lord knows accidents happen, so please do not take what I say out of context. Accidents happen, things happen that you didn't even cause. We get that. And I'm not speaking about that. Queen Elizabeth Hospital is overwhelmed, and I don't think that people should have to wait so long. But again, it is not a first come, first serve service. But you cannot tell people that their problem is not a problem unless they were assessed. I think what the public is saying, you don't even get an assessment in a short period of time for them to determine who is worse than who. And I'm putting that out there because that is the major problem right now going on. You go into the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, you're not even seen Sometimes you're not even screened for COVID or you have to wait before to get the assessment. I hope um, after the show, we should be able to reach out to people like Dr. Cave, who's always willing to come and speak with us and perhaps the chairman at the hospital because we're here on this show not to pull anybody down. We're here 
to share information. We're here to tell the truth. We're here to let people know what's going on. And we're here to allow those who can make a difference, tell the public what they're doing in order to make sure that they fix these problems. Equally, the public then should do what they can not to overwhelm the healthcare system. So you see, there's a balance that we all have. We have to balance it and we can't overwhelm the system. So to that writer, um, I empathize with your um, experience, uh, with your daughter. I'm a parent. I understand that the mother was waiting in the car park as well for hours and hours. And people are feeling that because the service is free, perhaps that is why people are treated, being treated the same way. Maybe QEH should start asking for insurance for those of us who can afford medical insurance and you arrive there at the hospital and you are um, conscious that you should be able to say or the person with you, yes, I have insurance and let that money then go towards the Queen Elizabeth Hospital and leave the QEH to persons who cannot afford health care. Government, I'm hoping, will be looking at that and going into in that direction because if you go to the other private um, healthcare facilities, they ask you if you have insurance. If you have insurance, you pay them. Why can't the Queen Elizabeth Hospital say to us, if you can pay and you have medical insurance, then you pay? You know, so then, then they're out of the hole somewhat financially because they're saying that they can't afford a lot of things. And then taxpayers know we're paying taxes, we expect better treatment. And then you're here, you don't have enough money. And then you're asking yourself, well, why are we paying taxes and where's my money um, going to? So I just basically wanted to share that with you and what that person said here and, and how scared that they felt. And uh, one of the points that they also made is the lack of communication. No one said anything. He spoke about patient advocates. Nobody communicated with him in English, French, or Spanish. And, uh, and that's the other thing too, when you don't communicate with people, how do they know e somebody should be there to ease his fears and to say to him, okay, we're gonna get to you. Someone there should be with his daughter to say, okay, we know you're in pain, take it easy, we'll be with you shortly. What happened to the, to the patient advocates? Because you're getting more and more complaints, you ask them, what about the patient advocates? People don't interact with them or not. You know, so again, QBH, you gotta be able to, if you can't do better, you gotta come more often. You have to go to every media house. I'm not saying our show. You gotta be there, you gotta explain to the public. And while you're explaining to the public, perhaps then, you know, you could be seeing patients and then encouraging people to have a whole program about avoiding kidney disease, have a whole program about avoiding diabetes, have a whole program as to how to manage your asthma. Someone here says we need to open back the polyclinics after hours to handle things like broken bones and asthma. Again, there are people who go to the Queen Elizabeth Hospital because they stump their toe, but then somebody comes in with a gunshot wound by the heart or a stab wound or a heart attack, then that, those people will take uh, priority. I also had a message from Gemma. She, she was a guest on the show with her twins with microcephaly. And Gemma was waiting in the hospital for hours and hours and I'm getting voice notes and no one is paying attention to her daughters and that is something that we have to look at. Her ch children are challenged, it is hard on her. Again, hospital will tell you, we don't know what's happening on the inside and they're doing their things to save lives and that your situation is not as bad. Okay, we get that. Sometimes you're in a lot more pain and it's, it feels a lot more worse than what it is. People get that. But what happens to the people that don't get assessed? What happens to the people that get there and sit down for hours and nobody, other than taking a name, nobody says anything? So obviously you're going to get irate. I'm not saying that you're condoning violence. But anyway, we got to wrap up. Great show today. Thank our guests. We come back next week, or should I say Friday? And we will be talking to you more about the elderly on Friday, as well as the fire service will be here to talk about those fires. I'm Joanne Haig. Take care.